having, I think it was uh, uh, sub situations, uh, someone else's problems. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. Cool. So shall we get going? We're about 10 minutes into the call. Um, I don't know, we may end up being a short call today. Um, yeah. I, I know, for example, like the, the one thing I'm aware of is the desire to go and turn the technology tree into more of a roadmap. And I think that that is gonna require a little bit of work coming up to the next meeting before it actually um, is useful to go over it. I think that's a good place to start them. Okay. So yeah, definitely. I mean, that's going to require a little bit of work because I basically just have the same tree that I had last week, um, which is good and all. Um, but the other one is that it's, it's sort of rapidly becoming, the world is moving on. So things like, um, I got word yesterday from, the, from one of the folks who's working on inner uh, domain that they, they, they sort of basically have it working now and now they're cleaning things up and testing across different clouds and so forth. Um, before they go ahead and push their PR. I saw we also have a um, an preliminary DNS implementation too. We do, we do. Um, it, it's it, it's really well done as far as it goes, but th there are still some questions that, that the, the person looking at it is asking that I think need to be resolved before you get there. If I'm reading it correctly, the current implementation won't, won't do the fan out quite correctly, but all the right pieces are in place. Um, which means that once we get the fan out functionality there, I think it's in the right place. So, and I, it, there's also great progress coming down on security. Um, apparently forward security is now working. Um, backward security is being looked at. So. Cool, when you say forward security, that's, um passing the spiffy SVIDs up the chain? Uh, it's, it's, it's doing the right thing for Providence for JWT tokens up the chain. JWT uh, tokens, okay. Yeah, and then the, the trick is that coming back properly and then the ability to safely and properly do healing based upon the returned JWT tokens. Okay, that makes sense. So. Well, do we have anything else that we want to discuss today? I think, I don't think that we do at this point. I mean, the, the important, some of the important discussions we need to have around, uh, around the release, I think are going to require people like Nikolai to be, to be present. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Let's see, so a couple comments. Oh, uh, Lucina pointed out network surface mesh on IO is live. Yeah, I'm still blown away by the quality of the website, so. Yeah, no, it, it really is. I mean, I, I find myself being tempted to go ping Luke on update on certain updates and say, "Hey, I was gonna here's the update. Can I get your just taste check on this? Because clearly your taste is better than mine." Um, <laughs> so, Yeah, my um, my one concern is that the uh, the what is network service mesh document has been promoted to uh, the first page on Docs, <laughs> so we need to fix that up. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely do fix that up. So.
Cool. Hey, welcome, Joshua. You, you sort of just wandered in, and we've determined that we, we have a bunch of homework to do for the next meeting, but we don't have a bunch to cover this meeting. Is the, um, Ms. Watson, is, is, the, is the glossary pretty much done? Or are we still, is this still a work in progress? I think so. Um, I mean, there has been stuff committed to the repository on the glossary. If there are things, but you know, obviously everything is always subject to improvement. Okay. Yeah, my, my understanding is like we've, we're, it, we're no longer listing the glossary as a main item on the agenda. So I think it's pretty much done except for, uh, except for minor improvements as, um, as Ed mentioned. So if you if you want to use that or you want to share it around, that that should be uh, that should not be a problem. Okay. Is there, a, is there a specific contribution you were looking to, to make towards it, or is there something that's, that you think needs to be uh, expressed out in more detail? Yeah, there's stuff that I've been trying to work on or tease out um, along the lines of the OSI model and then the different components in the glossary and CNFs in general. And um, I don't know, I just keep going around in circles when I'm thinking of the different pieces that we have named here, say like the local mechanisms, tunnel interface and MIS and these types of things and um, remote mechanisms and stuff. And it, it seems like to me, some language there that people are familiar with as far as like layer one, layer two, it seems like the local mechanisms are like layer one. They're like virtual layer one or something like that. And uh, and then maybe the remote mechanisms are things that are layer two and above those types of things. And it might be useful to start using some language that other people are familiar with. I'm not so sure. But I, I don't see the uh, like OSI model used but maybe once or twice. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that sort of goes both ways and it kind of depends on who the audience is. If you're talking to networking people, the OSI model is super useful. Um, if you're talking to devs, often they don't even know it. Yeah, well, so I'm, I'm a dev. <laughs> and to me, Not always, it's I said, like... I'm serious, you're also, <laughs> you're also a very, very curious dev, right? You, you, you <laughs> Well, the thing that I have a hard time with when going into any domain is when people change the language. So I'll do a pass on something like this glossary if I wasn't familiar with it and I'm looking at these, this terminology. And then I go cross-reference to a networking book. And I'm saying, okay, I'm not able to cross-reference here. I see some words, but where's this, this model? And then when you're in a, you're in a dialogue of, six or seven people, a group, and they're talking, and they're, the networking people are talking about layer one, layer two, layer three, and all these things. And you're like, wait a minute. You know, is it that NSM kind of goes around these things or, or what? And it, it seems to me that um, sometimes I was thinking maybe sometimes some things get lost when we start talking about software data planes and the difference between that and an ASIC and MEMIF, kernel interfaces, these are all things that uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems these things are kind of what's like with Ed, what you would always say, they are virtual represent. It's kind of sometimes the way when we think about it, sometimes it's a mistake. We think uh, we made the physical into the virtual and that was, a problem if we force that abstraction too much, mm -hmm. but it's all 
layer one. So um, there are better ways to, you know, some ways are better than others as far as implementing layer one. But then after that, you have layer two, which solves or brings up other issues, solves other problems, these types of things, and they need to be addressed. Yeah. And I think where, well, my point is, is that there are certain problems that are addressed at every layer. And that's where I, um, when I'm in different discussions, that's where things get lost with devs. Devs don't believe any, there are any problems so like the spanning tree protocol, like a layer two ethernet type problems. We don't know anything about that and we don't care about it. It must be, it must be done, it must be fixed. You don't care about that. We only yeah. care about layer three. Exactly. That's what I'm getting at. Well, and, and yeah. quite honestly, like, and this is a matter of personal opinion for me, um, I, I think it is ludicrous how much we still care about layer two in this day and age. I, you, know, <laughs> you, 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 can, make, you can make a really strong case that the two central sins of networking, the two things that have brought the most misery to the world, um, well, I actually put three in there, would be number one, um, the, the ridiculous ways that we weld IP to ethernet, right? And that we basically mm -hmm. kept L2 along, I mean, which effectively it comes down to shared media was the original sin and that led to all kinds of stupidity in L2 and therefore all mm -hmm. kinds of stupidity at the interface between L2 and L3. So shared media is the first sin. The second sin was um, having IP addresses identify both the location, use, be used as both identifiers and locators, which means now your identity at the IP layer is tied to location uh, in a way that's really unhelpful and leads to all kinds of crazy. And then the, the, the third sin is tying TCP connections to IP addresses the way we currently do, IP addresses and ports. Um, in such a way that they sort of mush together in, a, in an unfortunate way that makes the transport layer a little bit screwed up. Um, and the good news is the, you know, Kubernetes is pure L3, which means it's done away with the shared media uh, myth. Um, you know, locator identifier separation is still a little bit of a mess. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to TCP and its sins, Quick is coming and Quick has not made those mistakes. So lots of things are getting better. Yes. Um, so, makes all makes sense. The thing. So, the one thing I would say though is, uh, whenever and you guys are better at this type of discussion. Um, like whenever I'm in some of these conferences, and I could I told this to Fred before. When there's when there's a discussion with you guys, it I can see people don't really ask you certain questions. Because mm -hmm. they're just like, you know, and they're not, they're, maybe they don't want to look silly. But when I'm talking with people, one thing that maybe it just, it's silly, people don't believe they need a software data plane. Mm -hmm. They don't think that they need any data plane. They think that the IP tables, kernel faces, and all that does all of it. We don't care about that. Why do you need any of that? No, I, I yes, most, definitely and believe that. And most of the time, they're right. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, the, the way I usually describe it, trying to explain this to uh, network people, right? Because network people are like, oh, but you know, they have to do blah, blah, blah because of performance and scale. And, and my response is to turn to network people and say, look, the, the, the cloud native people will decide what they want. They will find a tool that solves the problem in the most straightforward way. And they will call it good up until the point they hit the wall on scale and performance. So it is mm -hmm. a loose argument to try and go in and say, Hey, but bloody, 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 blah, lots more complexity because scale and performance. Um, that's a losing argument, generally speaking. And part of why it's a losing argument is that, um, quite honestly, if you're sitting on the other table with the cloud native people, at least half the time and probably closer to 80% of the time when someone tries to buffalo you with that argument, um, it's bullshit. You don't care. Right? So mm -hmm. um, where I see people actually starting to care is, you know, when they hit the wall on scale and performance, right? So mm -hmm. the IP table stuff. Um, you know, you, you came in literally 18 months ago and there were lots of people already hitting the wall on that where it simply did not scale. Um, and so, you know, they came back, it's like, well, we'll do this IPVS, PVS. Well, which was a little bit better, um, but still doesn't really scale or perform when you actually get up, scale up. 
Um, so you've got a bunch of people who've hit the wall there. And now people are saying, well, we'll do it with eBPF. And it'll be interesting to see to what degree that actually scales and performs. Um, it'll clearly be better than what we're doing right now with IPVS. But my guess is that once you get a critical mass of people hitting the wall there, that you'll have people looking for solutions as well. And again, I think this is actually smart, um, which is you, you try and solve your performance is best measured, not imagined. Um, but you know, it, it, it is a, it does make the conversation different than what the network people are used to having. Yeah. I, yeah. I think there's, there's a few things going on as well. So first, um, um, I think people are, are more comfortable talking to you than they are talking to us. Like with us, they'll say, they obviously know what they're doing. There must be something right there. I don't, I don't really see it, but I don't want to, but I, but I don't want to look stupid by asking a question. And so uh, that's where our messaging becomes very important to, to help with, with, with them to understand like, that not only like, uh, sh sh it's, it's not, the question is not only like, do you, uh, like how do you do this stuff, but you would do you even need it in the first place. Like most developers, if they're saying, well, I don't think I need this, uh, that's perfectly fine. And in fact, we would encourage them to not use it if, uh, if they came up to us with, some, with, a, with something that looked like a, uh, the opposite of a need. And so uh, when it comes to another issue that I think that we're, that we're going to, to see is I think we start looking at the two different communities. So if, if you talk to someone like, uh, uh, I'll use uh, Ian as an example. So you talk to someone like Ian, who's very enmeshed in the telecommunications industry. He, you know, he's looking for like that, that SROV support and like, how do you maximize that overall performance? It's like you talk to, uh, you talk to the people who are looking for his type of services. They're, they're, they're going to be all about let's maximize speed. Let's get throughput, you know, while controlling complexity. Um, developers, couldn't care less or they so what they end up doing is they end up uh, that, that's part of the reason why we we focus on the on the Sarah narrative is that you know when, when I talk with a developer and say well why do I need this and says well usually you don't but what if you but let's say that you had a, a workflow where you were connecting a pod to a financial VPN and you didn't want to expose your entire cluster to it. You want to make sure that that specific workload was the only thing that was able to connect to it because of your business security policies. Um, how would you do it? And, and then usually by then they, uh, they say, oh, okay, I, see, I, I can see where I would use NSM for that. And so, so it, really, it really depends on, on, the, on the user where like, they, they know that there's some interesting, amazing magic that goes on but they really don't want to care about it. It's, it's literally, it, it is the embodim, um, embodiment of the sex situation in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, and, and I don't think they're wrong about, about that because even if they knew about the problems that, that occurred in the telco space, what could they do about it? And so it's, it's good for them to be able to focus on, on, their, on their specific problems that they have in need and make sure that they build something that can make use of new of uh, new improvements going on on the infrastructure. Yeah. Okay. So the app developer is one and they don't care. Like they just aren't. They, yeah. What we were saying, this fourth profile, we were talking about profiles. Maybe there's a fourth, fourth profile. It's like an infrastructure developer and a data center type person who's setting up the networks and stuff in a larger data center. Let's say, a government type data center or something where there's going to be you, you have to care about performance at some some at some level maybe it's not a telco but you're you're hitting that you have to be mindful you just can't set up the infrastructure however you want and they don't seem to be the biggest networking guys oftentimes or they could be you know, I don't know. Well, and, and, and so, it's like if you want high performance, then you have to do things for high performance. That's always been true in networking, right? So they could do just willy nilly anything and we'll keep working, right? Network service mesh is carefully designed to keep working. Um, but, you know, if they want 
they want all kinds of cool tricks that their physical network could do for them, they may have to do something to expose that via network service mesh. So I had a fantastic conversation with a person who actually sets up data centers. Um, and uh, I found that all of my usual discussions that I typically have with people didn't, did not feel appropriate with, with this individual. So uh, when I was describing network service mesh to him, uh, one of the things that I, that I realized was that the data center uh, has a couple of problems that they're running into. So the first one is the, they have no insight into the workloads that are running on top of them, which means that they cannot adjust for the type of workloads that they, that they need. So if you just need standard networking, okay, that's fine. If you want to bring in something that does something special, then they're, they're very limited. Like they can provide something special, but they're very limited in their capability to, to do so or, or, or express it out. Uh, and when they do so, they, they, end up use, they end up expressing out APIs that are, um, that are potentially uh, tightly couple them to that particular uh, family of data centers and so on. So when we were talking about uh, network service mesh, it was like, you know, well, what, what additional services or things could they provide access to and potentially bundle up as a service. So if you wanted something that, that provided, you know, even something is like, it could be something at a high level, it could be like a VPN or it might be something at a, at a lower level that does something special in their infrastructure to, to do some traffic management or to, uh, or to guarantee some type of quality, then being able to, to request for those things with, uh, in a declarative way with labels and so on is something that they could build towards that would give them a unified interface uh, for re requesting those type of those type of things, and so uh, so he was quite excited with the concept of of network service mesh from the from the purposes of being able to expose out and refine the capabilities of the data center's fabric. Yep. I've had similar conversations as well. Okay. So, but that's a very specific type of infrastructure person. Um, I think uh, your average inter infrastructure person that we're probably going to run into in the beginning is going to be enterprise infrastructure. So not the data center person, but the, the person who runs the, the clusters. And to be honest, I think the biggest use case we're going to have for them uh, in the beginning, it's probably going to be Sarah's, uh, Sarah's use case, you know, literally hooking up VPNs from one organization to another. And I, yeah, you know, that turns out that's a crazy uh, difficult problem even today. And it's not uncommon for that scenario to take several months, uh, sometimes up to six months to, to establish connectivity. Wow. So if you can go and say, hey, we can do this, you know, once you've signed the paperwork, so you can't, doesn't even fix the legal side entirely. Uh, but once, once they've signed the paperwork and, and have agreed to share, to share a connection, you know, the, I, my hope is that they can, they can set it up in five minutes. <laughs> that, that's my, that's my hope. You know, you, you share, you share the key, they share the secrets. And then you, you see, you load up network service mesh and say, connect me to this thing with these secrets. And then off you go. You're, you have a, you have a, pod loaded that that's or VM loaded uh, in your in your infrastructure that just that just does its thing. Yeah. So no yeah. it's, it's it's a lot of it is about keeping the world simple. Um, it, it turns out that that there's only really one feature that people are looking for in layer one. And that's the things you shove in one and come out the other. Um, but if you go to layer two, the number of features that people want and what features they want and the fact that the features conflict with each other gets to be really gnarly. <laughs> yeah, and, and the way that I, that I try to think about it is, um, so also, um, have, have, you, have you heard of the term uh, link local? I have. 
So, so what I try to think of is the NSM uh, V wires, as, as we're calling them, um, is trying to keep link local actually local between just in, uh, two connections. So uh, that way, and and above that, you, just, you can have routing and so on. But it like, literally tries to constrain as much as possible the uh, the link local to a uh, to a very small to a very small domain. Makes sense. Okay. That that one won't work on enterprise developers though. For most of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a bunch of things that um that. I was gonna try to push into the doc that uh, Jeffrey is doing. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I guess there's the other doc that is the more of the, I guess on the vendor side. So I guess there's some things there. We should probably, I don't know, in the end merge everything, but um, I'm trying to, trying to, as far as on the CI CD side, trying to pull the best practices on over and try to look at some of the things that MSM brings to the table. One of the, we have another doc called the out of band doc for the best bed. And they're saying, well, okay, what all is installed here? That is what we're saying out of band. Well, kind of installed in a way that is not maybe Kubernetes type native so outside of <laughs> right <laughs> so um and then say this is one of the drivers for using the nsm in the test bed is because okay now we're installing things using helm and getting away from the imperative style um scripts for installing and trying to get closer to declarative and these types of things and um trying to say, okay, this is proper CI CD, nicer um, installation um, scripts that can be used in or uh, within the orchestration for Kubernetes. And then like what you guys are talking about with self healing and everything, some of that stuff, it's all wound up together. Um, so trying to pull that in and then the reasoning behind why um, why something is even cloud native, you know, having things like what you would say added loosely coupled um, and other things, why you can't have everything all coupled together, most likely all in one big VM, three different concerns or however many, um, and then call it cloud native. I think that that's maybe some of Jeffrey's concern. I know that's almost, yeah. Concern. I mean, and the good news is there's a lot to be drawn from the cloud native definition itself, right? So you, you start, you know, the, the, the really top place to start is immutable infrastructure. Uh, and I, I suspect that 100% of everything you're doing for out of band deployment violates that, right? Mm -hmm. Then yeah. loose coupling. Um, I'm not sure that 100% of everything you're doing for what you call out of band violates loose coupling, but I guess a lot of it does. Um, and then minimal toil. You guys can comment on on how minimal the toil was um, <laughs> in, in doing all that stuff, right? So, like right there, I'd say, look, you know, you guys went in totally eyes open. You wanted to be able to get some performance numbers. You made very very well reasoned choices around the out of band stuff, but that can't be the way the world works in the in the limit of actual deployments. Yeah, yeah, the new mozo new zone struggling CPU pinning. That's all going to be like with the immutable infrastructure that's going to be all probably out of band and trying to talk about how we're going to bring it in scope and, um, and make it native it's going to be part of the discussion so yep. but yeah all that stuff i want to somehow circle it back into um it seems like some a piece that could be for NSM talking about 
how you bring things. If we use that language in band, out of band, or we decide to keep that language, bringing things more, making them more cloud native. I mean, I, I would actually, I mean, you may just want to consider making the first thing clear, which is you have the non-cloud native things that you're doing and then the cloud native things that you're doing. That might make it quite a bit clearer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I know so it's like uh, that, that phrase out of band. Yeah, the, I think the reason why Dan prefers those terms is that for certain, um, for certain communities and people, those are those are fighting words. Like, what do you mean? What I'm doing is like cloud native. Yeah, I, I, I understand <laughs> that there are certain communities that are very attached to doing non-cloud native things and don't like it being pointed out. Yeah, <laughs> which is which is part of the reason that we're that uh, we're looking at using the term bronze rather than. Um, um, that, that, that is perhaps too shiny and durable a metal. But yes, yes. Um, but no, I, I, I trust Dan's wisdom in this regard. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I the, nothing, nothing that you do to massage the terms changes the fact that there are significant constituencies who desperately want to go to market as vendors with their utterly non-cloud native solutions um, and shove them at customers who are SPs um, and desperately want people to stop pointing out how non-cloud native they are. Yeah, so my goal is to not <laughs> label <laughs> something. Uh, it's really to say this is what it means and hear the arguments. If you're not doing these things, then you, you're not cloud native, but I'm not going to say you're not cloud native. Yeah. And for CICD, these are the goals for it to be cloud native so it can be orchestratable and things. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't get the benefits. Yep. Actually, instead of bronze uh, CNF, like perhaps the perhaps there needs to be a term towards. As I mean, the entire concept on that stuff was to provide a progression. So as a uh, first is to provide a progression. So if you're trying to become a best practices cloud native network function, like here's a here's a reasonable path that uh, things you can do to move up the to move up the chain. The second thing is uh, is risk mitigation for the operators because your risk profile is going to look very different if you take a, a bronze CNF from a gold CNF. And so uh, I think I think that uh, part of what's going to end up happening is my, my hope is that what happens is that the operators, they, they don't look at it as a rubber stamping of a CNF where you just had a lift and shift minus um, things that require privilege and sticking it in a container. Uh, and instead look at it as an A, well, we, our risk profile is we will only accept uh, gold CNFs and we will review on a case-by-case -case basis uh, bronze and silver uh, based, upon, based upon availability in the market and, and need and, and so on. And so, so my hope is to Provide them with the tools. I will refrain from pointing out some of the other uh, entertaining monikers that have been suggested to replace bronze. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, I just say they were they were not uh, they were not friendly. <laughs> and so, but, uh, okay. That's all I have. Uh, for now. Yeah, but keep uh, keep telling us when you when you hear things that you know where people are are unwilling or unable to to tell us because like this this is very this is very useful as well. Yeah, yeah. My the rule of thumb I'm saying is if I hear something you know 50 times, I'll make a video based on it. Things have been changing a lot lately, but we keep saying things over and over, then I know we can do a five, three, five minute video on it. Um, I was hoping this glossary or something along these lines, if it's, you know, we keep using this terminology, then that might be it. Um, but we'll see. And uh, to paraphrase the Department of Homeland Security, if you see something, say something. <laughs> All 
Uh, it, it, it is it is very useful, like because it, it helps us work out if we get the messaging right and helps us work out um, where we need to where we need to improve and uh, and it also helps us work out where where we are getting things wrong. So sometimes the questions are not due to a lack of understanding, but because there is understanding there and and they've identified a problem. Mm -hmm. Cool. Awesome. So, shall we? Do we have anything else that we need to discuss in this call? I don't think so. I think um, I think it's pretty much it. All right. Cool. Talk to you guys next week. Thank you very much. Okay. See you. Thank you.